great pleasure to welcome you here today. My name is Joshua Castellino. I used to be Dean of the School of Law here, now Executive Director of Minority Rights Group International, but I've been really roped into doing this, and it's a real, real pleasure to do it. So I had to fight to ensure that I could play this role that I used to, to play formally, because it's such an important event, I think, for Erica, and for me also a very personal event, because to see this particular progression means a lot. Of course, inaugural lectures are a time to celebrate uh, an academic career that's full of lots of publications, lots of student trajectories, and lots of exciting projects all around the world. And of course, that's primarily what we are here to do today. And as part of that, of course, you get Erica Howard in full flow talking about the subjects that she's so passionate and so well known around the world for. So uh, my role here is to give you a little bit of a, a taster, some kind of an introduction uh, to, to really what it is that Erica has done and done so well. So Erika finished her PhD at, at Queen Mary University and Prakash is here, welcome. Uh, good to see you here as well. And in that particular thesis, that there were two elements that I think stood out that have defined Erika's work since then. One is work around the issue of freedom of religion and the other is the issue of EU law. Now Laurent and I have had this fight over a while as to whether Erika Howard belongs to the human rights team or the European Union team. I leave you judge at the end of this. If you hear very, very many mentions of Brexit, you might want to, want to reconsider which team she fits in. I suspect you won't hear very much of it. That's to reassure you, by the way. Uh, Erica's work has stood out. It stood out not only for the quality that she brings to it, because she brings deep knowledge, deep understanding, and she really reads into these particular su subjects. She's strong on the doctrine of equality, one of the best writers, I would argue, on the doctrine of equality and non-discrimination, but she's really strong on its application, and especially on the challenges that this particular area faces at a time of great, great issue in, in society. And I would argue at a time of societal breakdown, when issues around equality and non-discrimination are reduced to pithy statements by ignorant people who masquerade as politicians. So I think the, 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 the richness that Erica brings to some of these debates is sometimes, I think, lost on much of the public discourse. But I think for those of her students who benefit from this, and others around us who have watched and read Erika's work over the years. It really is a source of inspiration and a source of real understanding of the issues at stake and how they can be tackled in a meaningful, sympathetic, calm, but objective and scientifically great way. And I think that's something that has stood out for Erika's work. Now, teaching a subject like this at Middlesex brings particular challenges because Middlesex students are extremely diverse and Middlesex students come from many different backgrounds. So it's not the easiest thing to walk into a classroom and talk about LGBT rights, to walk into a classroom and challenge people around religion. And I think to be able to do that with the success that Erica has done over the years at Middlesex, pays testimony not only to her, not only to her intellectual abilities, but to, her, to, to things like empathy. And the empathy that I think Erica shows in her dealings with our students and with our colleagues empowers them, gets them to be excited about the subject area, and I would argue gets them to be really, really good lawyers. Because in the end, they get not just the law and the challenges that they sit in society, but they get the underpinning issues as well. And that, of course, is because Erica herself has a, a multidisciplinary background and brings that very much to the fore. But Erica's work doesn't stop at Middlesex University. She is now increasingly sought after by equality commissions, the Com Equality Commission here, and the Equality Commission on Ireland, the Dutch Equality Commission, by the European Union. Erica has done lectures in Trieste, the very famous center on, on European Union law. And I think these are all indicative of the fact that end users outside who are working on these issues look to her work for inspiration and ideas. And I find that in my current role as a practitioner at, at, at Minority Rights Group International, where equality and non-discrimination are fundamental issues, much of what Erica writes and talks about has real resonance, not just in, in, in Britain and not just in Europe, but actually far beyond Europe, because the analysis that she presents is immediately accessible and immediately it can be interpreted to many different theaters that she perhaps hasn't written about. Uh, I saw her most recently in Work with Brazil, and again, the, her manner of engagement in Brazil on these questions which are central, and you may be following the news in Brazil with the, the last presidential elections, equality and non-discrimination issues are fundamental and are fundamentally under threat, like in other places. And Erica's intervention on the Brazilian program meant that she had to then, we had to then find ways to send her over for a few months because they wanted to tap her and they wanted to, to essentially get 
so many of these ideas on European Union law, on equality, on non-discrimination, on the freedom of religion, to an audience that hadn't been exposed to many of these issues. So Erika breaks regular ground. She has the usual things you would, you would expect in a CV of a professor. She's got incredibly large European Union funding on a range of different issues, but she's also got smaller funding for, for organizations that are trying to make a key difference. So you find the funding applications there. The books, the two books in particular are outstanding, but they come with a range of other pieces of work, smaller and larger pieces of work, published in, in, in refereed journals and also reports. And of course, Erika has now has a number of PhD students, four, I think, last, at last count, that have completed. Uh, she's not sure. Four. Four completed, that's right. Four completed and a number of other PhD students in what is a growing doctoral school of nearly 150 strong at Middlesex Law School. So Erika, I've tried to give our colleagues here a taste of what it is that you can do, but I think you can do much better. So it is a great honor for me to call upon Professor Erika, Erika Howard to give her inaugural professor lecture, which is entitled Letterboxes and Bank Robbers, Equality, Freedom of Religion, and the Freedom of Expression. Thank you very much. I'm not quite so loud as Joshua, i better put a microphone on. Well, thank you, Joshua. Wow, what's that me? And um, thank you very much for that great introduction. And thank you everybody for coming and sharing this occasion with me. Um, it's nice to see so many friends, family, colleagues. Um, my sister Leia decided that she was going to be here as representative of the Dutch side of our family. And I think there's some more Dutch speakers here. So, goede avond allemaal. Wat leuk dat jullie er zijn. I won't do the rest in Dutch because I don't know if I lose my audience if I do too much of that. Um, <coughs> As in all girls go, mine is probably quite early. There is often a longer time between them. But, and I don't want to make, mention Brexit ever again, but I thought if Britain falls off a cliff in March next year, if I'm kicked out of this country in March next year, then at least I've had mine in all girl. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I wanted to do it early. Um, Josh was already said, or already, referred to the person who said this, letterboxes and bank robbers. This was, of course, Johnson used to refer to women who wear face veils. Um, of course, got a lot of media attention, which no doubt was what he wanted anyway. Um, but the wearing of religious symbols, of religious clothing, has been quite controversial, quite um, in use in a lot of countries in Europe. Um, and a hotly debated topic, so it's one of the things that I have looked at. <coughs> Sorry. Um, now, of course, Boris' remarks also gave, um, led to a lot of cartoons, and I just thought I'd get this one. So why do I call it letterboxes and bank robbers? Um, it's because Boris' remarks really sum up two main areas of my research in the last eight years or so. Um, one of those areas is the wearing of religious symbols and bans on the wearing of religious symbols and how that fits in with law. And the other area is the relation between freedom of speech and freedom of expression. Oh, sorry, freedom of speech and freedom of religion. Um, and <coughs> those are the two areas that I've looked at. My PhD research before then was on race discrimination in the EU, and of course that fits in quite well with the religious discrimination. Um, and of course, the subtitle equality, uh, freedom of religion, and freedom of expression are those, and sum up those three areas as well. Um, before I do that, I want to tell a little bit about myself. I hope I'm not embarrassing my sister too much. I was told that I couldn't put pictures of the boys on there, so I have left my sons out. <laughs> um, I grew up in Osterhout, which is a small place in the southern part of Holland. Uh, where I was born, um, with my mum and dad and two sisters. 
I have an older sister and a younger sister, so I'm the middle one. They always say the middle child is the best one. Um, well, that's what I've been told. Um, I, my father was a teacher, and most of the time the, when we were little, he worked in school for children with learning difficulties. My older sister is a kindergarten and a primary school teacher. My younger sister is a secondary school teacher and a speech therapist. And with me covering higher education, we cover you from the cradle to the grave. <laughs> Unfortunately, my two sisters have now retired. Um, I, uh, <coughs> one happy memory from my youth is when my father took me to the library. I just started learning to read. I couldn't read very much. But my father took me to the local library and I was allowed to take a book home. I picked a book called Miffy, and I think you'll, or a Dutch named it. Um, and not many words, but at least I have my reading book, and I was very proud of taking the book home with me. I've been an avid reader ever since, and only recently I've given up going to the local library because I've used my Kindle. That, it was one of the things that I did. Um, I had a very happy childhood. We spent summers going out on our bikes, going to the local woods, going to the swimming pool. Of course, on our bikes, because I'm Dutch. Um, and in the winters, we did snowballs, snow f snowball fights, snowmen, and we skated in the local park, if the ice was uh, thick enough. Now, that is maybe something that is strange for people here. I had never skated on an ice rink until I came to the UK. We always skated outside in the park at the end of our road. Um, <coughs> then, at the end of my secondary school, um, I had to decide what I wanted to do, and I decided I wanted to do medicine. Unfortunately, at that time, you had to join in a lottery to get a place in medicine, because there were far, far more people who wanted to do medicine uh, than there were places. Um, then the other place decided, what shall I do? Might as well do law for a year. Um, so I went to Tilburg University, did law for a year, at the end of that year, I decided, maybe I should stick with law. <laughs> um, maybe I should not try this lottery again and just stick with law. And here I am, still doing law. Um, I got my master's degree in Tilburg, then worked as a lawyer, legal advisor for a union of te for teachers. Again, the teaching link. And then I worked for a law centre for a while. Um, I had met my husband, and when we came to the UK, we decided to get married, and we came to the UK. When I came here, I decided maybe I should get a UK qualification. So I did an MA in Sociology and Law at Brunel University, um, and um, that was good, not only to get an MA, but it was also good for my English skills, and it was very good for learning to drive on the wrong side of the road, because I had to drive to university. Um, that's the graduation photo. Um, I was eight, just over eight months pregnant with my older son, Mark, at that time. Uh, <coughs> I came. Don't worry, Ben. You're going to be mentioned as well in a minute. And I became a stay-at-home mom. I was lucky that I could, that we could afford it, and I could stay at home. And um, Ben was born just over two years later. Um, and I got involved. With ben was born. <laughs> um, just over two years later. Um, I got involved with lots of things with the kids: school, swimming club, scouts. Names and I was part of that. But when they got grew up to grow up, I decided to do a master's at my local university, which is Hertfordshire. Um, and I did a master's in international law, and one of the subjects I did there was EU law. And around, I really enjoyed the EU law. So if you're sucking me extra points, <laughs> I'll come back to the EU law. <laughs> do I have to choose? Um, no, I did EU law, but before I finished my master's, my, actually my dissertation was on EU citizenship, so I was well before the time that I started worrying about it. Um, during my master's, they asked me to do some teaching in EU law again. Now, I had not never taught before, and of course I was only one step ahead of the students, but I managed to do the teaching. And one day I came home and said to my husband, Chris, um, I really enjoyed that, but if I want to do anything in academia, I should get a PhD. And he said, why don't you? So I did, which we've already heard, as Prakasha, my supervisor of Queen Mary in London. My PhD started 
oh, with my PhD was on race discrimination in the EU. Um, and why? I wanted to do something in EU social law, EU human rights law, and things like that. Um, so I came across these directives that had come out in 2000 um, against discrimination. And there was one directive against race discrimination and a separate directive on disability, age, religion and belief, and sexual orientation discrimination. So why were there two directives? Why was race separate? That was the sort of things I wanted to look about. Um, equality and uh, discrimination was interest of mine, although I don't think I've really suffered a lot of discrimination or uh, experienced a lot of discrimination. Uh, one of the things, when I went to university, I had a, my best friend, wants to, to go to university as well. But her father wasn't that keen, because he said girls are getting married and then give up work anyway. My friend did a psychology degree and worked all her life as an educational psychologist. And um, when I worked for a law center, um, I was sitting in with a colleague, a female colleague, and when she walked out of the room, we had a, an elderly couple in who wanted a, a legal problem, and she went out of the room, and then this, this lady said to me, are you both lawyers? I said, yes, we're both lawyers. Gosh, girls get into everything these days. <laughs> um, yes, we do. <laughs> and of course, the classical, when I had a, a trainee uh, colleague sitting in with me, a male colleague, some clients still address the male colleague rather than, oh, although he is a trainee. Um, anyway. My PhD, let me tell you a bit about my PhD, so had a more social legal focus. I looked at theories of race and racism, and I looked at concept of equality, um, and then I used those as a the, the sort of uh, yardstick to look at the race directive. Um, and uh, <coughs> during my PhD, I published four articles, which got me the job of Middlesex, I think. Um, at 2007, because this was just before the RAE, the, what then was called the Research Assessment, ex research assessment Exercise, um, in 2008, and they wanted my articles to submit to that uh, assessment. It's now called the REF, the Research Excellence Framework, and I'm now involved with the, <laughs> the follow-up of that for the 2020 grants. One of the professors here said, as soon as I started working, and she's not here anymore, but she said, get your PhD published. So I did, I'm fine. Um, some reviews, some uh, rejections, some requests for changes, and it got finally got published as a book. There's a book. Um, and one of the things, from the start, I've really enjoyed the combination of teaching and research. Um, and that is more so now I'm teaching in the areas of my research. I'm teaching equality law and I'm teaching uh, UK and European anti-discrimination law. <coughs> now, I think, oh, in a sense, partly by change, by by chance, I got onto this subject. I wanted to go to Dublin with a couple of colleagues and have a weekend in Dublin. And if we can hold it up on a, on a, con a conference, then that would be even better. So I picked this subject. This is the first page on my slides at that time. Um, I picked this subject, although I didn't know that much about it. Uh, <coughs> I talked about reasons for bans on the wearing of religious symbols. So why, what were the arguments to bring this in? And I looked at whether this was justified under human rights law. But really, after the conference, I started looking into the subject a lot more, more deeper. Um, and that led to two articles. First of all, I looked at bans on religious symbols as a violation of discrimination law. And then I did an article as a ban, um, bans on religious symbols as part of human rights law. So I've gone back to human rights now. Um, these are pictures I've used in many presentations ever since, because I've done quite a lot of presentations on that. Once I've done those articles, I decided, hang on, there is definitely a book in here as well. Um, so I decided, again, I did a book because I thought I can 
sort of expand on the, the articles that I've written. Um, I can look at the reasons for the moment, which I have done for a conference in Dublin. Uh, but I can also look at other ways of dealing with uh, religious symbols, like reasonable accommodation or mainstreaming duties. Um, and I decided to concentrate on education because there wasn't that much written about education and there were quite a few cases that concerned education. Um, I came to the conclusion that justification in this area um, played a really big role and that all instruments often apply a proportionality test. And a proportionality test is a test that looks at balancing of the different <coughs> interests involved. Thanks to research leave of Middlesex University, I managed to get the book to the publisher on time. Um, and in a sense, this short presentation in Dublin led to a lot of other things. Um, it led to a number of articles, it led to the book, um, and also to articles about related subjects. Um, for example, I did an article <coughs> on the gender equality argument for bans on religious symbols. People often say we need to ban the wearing of religious symbols, and if they talk about religious symbols, it's usually <coughs> Muslim religious symbols. We need to ban this because we have to save these women because they are made to wear symbols <coughs> by their men, their husband, their, hus their uh, father, their husband, or community leaders. Um, so I did an article about that, saying that I didn't think the gender equality argument worked, and that gender equality works if anything, um, please, against balance. Um, I also did an article on whether a duty of reasonable accommodation would help um, in relation to religion. And I was very proud because Lady Hale, now the President of the Supreme Court, referred to my article in one of the Supreme Court cases. <coughs> As a lawyer, what more can you want? Um, so that was one of my, my articles. <laughs> then I, I really moved sideways, or whichever way you want to say it. Um, I looked at the intersection between religious discrimination and sexual orientation discrimination. Um, and then with my colleague Alice, Alice Donald, um, we did a report for the, the European branch of the International Lesbian Gay Association um, on the intersection of those rights. Um, I presented a report to the UN. I was uh, invited to present that report by a special rapporteur on religion and belief. Um, Alice and I were also involved in research, which Joshua already mentioned, with uh, on a call for evidence on religion and belief in the Equality and Human Rights Commission here in this country. Um, I was asked, and I thought, I just put all the reports on one side, and you can hand over it and we can move on. Um, I also did a report for the EU, EU Parliamentary Service, Research Service on religion in the EU. And I did a report on the wearing of religious clothing in employment for the European Commission. Um, <coughs> then you could say, I moved sideways, or sideways, I moved a um, slight different direction again. And I looked into freedom of expression and religious hate speech, and especially speech by politicians. It came, of course, out of my work on religion and belief, but it also came from the Dutch politician Geert Wilders, who has for years commented on Islam as a violent, backward religion, incompatible with Western values with Dutch society. But one of the things that always struck me that if he's challenged, the first thing he does is invoke his right to free speech and saying, I'm only saying what a lot of people in Holland are thinking and I'm contributing to the public debate. Now, that is very much the language of human rights. Um, so he used human rights to defend his speech. Um, this is one of the things that he said, I am not, I don't hate Muslims, I only hate Islam. Um, but that raises the question, should this, be, this sort of speech be banned? <coughs> or, is this something that falls under the freedom of expression? And if it falls under freedom of expression, what does that do for the people that politicians like builders insult? Now, I say I'm from sideways. Of course, it has something to do with my previous research. 
And Wilders was very much, as always, of course, as part of hating Islam, and always said a lot against the wearing of headscarves. At one stage, he uh, suggested that we should have a head rag tax, a tax on headscarves. Because he said he's had a second time on headscarves, and if we tax them, we get something back from Islam. Isn't that a good idea? He actually compared that tax with a tax on pollution as well. Anyway, that fits in with the previous research anyway. Um, here Columbus has been prosecuted twice, and that's under Dutch law, um, under hate speech laws, and under the Dutch criminal code. Um, but really, I sort of, it, it led me to sort of talk, do you have to have laws against hate speech, religious hate speech? Should we use them against politicians like Wilders, or other politicians, Boris, maybe? Um, or for, does that fall on their right to free speech? And if we don't ban them, what about people's freedom of religion? So that was the two areas that I really wanted to look at and, and how these two, whether these clashed, how these clashed. And, and again, I was very lucky to get another six months of research leave. Um, and I hadn't really done too much on this subject before I started. But once I, I started my research leave, I really got into the subject, and before the end of my research leave, I had an article accepted, but that was not published till a year later. Which meant, because there was all this fuss going on about King Wilders in Holland, and because he was going to the court in Holland, <coughs> then I had to adjust my article a number of times. Then it was published. But during my research leave, I also decided, again, there could be a book in this. Let's see if we can write another book. I did a book proposal and the proposal was accepted. Um, now, I don't know, many of you were at my book launch last year. I won't repeat the rant against the Pierre Wilders that I did then. I think you had enough of that last time. Um, maybe what I should have done then, and what I want to do now a little bit more, is talk about um, what the book was about. Um, my central question in the book is, whether legal prohibition of religious hate speech violates speakers or authors' right to freedom of expression under the European Convention of Human Rights. I wanted to specifically look at um, politicians like Wilders. Um, so I looked at politicians and those people who contribute to the public debate. Um, I used Pierre Wilders as a case study in the last chapter of the book. Um, now, you might wonder why I have two versions of this book. I wonder that as well. Um, <laughs> my, that's the book as I got it. That's the, pic, the, the front picture that I picked. But when it came out, I was really disappointed that it looked just like my other book. Um, <laughs> so, it was, so hopefully, the paperback next year comes out like this. Maybe then I'll have a book that is slightly different from the other. Other one. Um, but, yes, we'll, we'll just wait and see when the paperback comes out. As I said, Wilders has been prosecuted twice. Um, and that's a quote from his first trial. Um, a very typical Wilders quote, I think. Um, he, the first trial ended in acquittal. But the second trial, in 2016, led to his conviction for the defamation of a population group based on race and inciting hatred and discrimination. Of course, he didn't turn up at the trial, but he tweeted all the way through. It was an absurd and political trial. Um, he did make use of his right to have the last word. Um, he went to the trial. Um, he was convicted, but of course he, and the public prosecutor both appealed and is now going to the courts again. Um, I think it might actually end up in the European Court of Human Rights unless he is not, the conviction is not upheld. So, what does that mean under Article 10 of the European Convention of Human Rights? Article 10 gives the freedom of expression. But Article 10 too then says that the right to freedom of expression is not absolute. There are ways, or there are times when you can have restrictions on the right to freedom of expression. 
And Article 10 says you need that needs to be done in the law. Um, it needs to, uh, <coughs> sorry, it needs to be necessary in a democratic society, and that has been interpreted as that the interference with the right must be necessary and proportionate to the legitimate aim pursued. And the article itself mentions the legitimate aim, and one of those is the rights of others. Um, so in a sense, you could say that Article 10 has a three-part justification test. Legality, necessity, and proportionality. And proportionality includes the balancing test. Now, one of the things that the European Court of Human Rights has always held is that political speech is very important. Freedom of expression for politicians is very important. Because politicians should be able to bring over their views to canvas for votes. So it's a very high protection for political speech. In my book, I came to the conclusion that freedom of expression of politicians and others that contribute to the public debate should not be restricted except in two very um, special circumstances, or very exceptional circumstances. First is when the speech um, incites to hatred and violence, and violence is imminently likely to follow, or when the speech stops people from holding or practicing their religion or belief. I think in other situations it should not be uh, limited. And these are the reasons why I think it should not be limited. Um, firstly, I don't think, or oh, if, if you limit the freedom of speech of politicians too much, that will have a chilling effect. That will lead to self-censorship. It will might stop people from saying. And of course you can ask, does it really work in a time when something goes viral within seconds? Um, so the practical effect is probably, of a, of a prohibition is probably very little. Um, even if there is obnoxious hate speech, it will go around the world very quickly. But also, I think, if you force people to put, to, to moderate their language, to put their message in, in a more modern language, it doesn't change what they're thinking. It doesn't change what politicians want to bring into practice when they get to power. <coughs> and, and it creates, as they say, a wolf in sheep's clothing. And the last argument is also that I think if you prosecute politicians, um, you really give them the best thing you can give them. Lots of airtime, lots of media attention, and during the trials here, Wilders has a way of time speaking to everybody and everything, apart from to the judges, of course, because he doesn't go to court. But it gives him a lot of airtime. It gives him a platform, extra platform to bring over his message. And it also gives him a chance to say, I'm a free speech martyr. I am being prosecuted for exercising my right to free speech. So really, my conclusion is that it is quite counterproductive. Uh, prosecute politicians like Keir Wilders. Um, as I said, the last chapter of my book contained a case study of Keir Wilders. Um, and I think that his conviction, if it stands, is a breach of his right to freedom of expression. Um, and I expect the case could go to Strasbourg, to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. Um, of course, we had a recent case against Austria, which might throw all this in doubt, and maybe the, the European Court of Human Rights will upheld his conv conviction, but that case might still go to the Grand Chamber of the Court. Um, but anyway, there are new developments, and what does new development mean? More chances of writing about these things. Um, <laughs> during my... Um, during the writing of the book and everything, of course, the wearing of religious symbols, bans on the wearing of religious symbols, did not go away. Um, that kept on issues in different countries. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a furore about the burkinis on French beaches and the fact that the Fr French, uh, French wanted to um, ban those. Um, France is the first country to have a ban on the wearing of 
form, a phase form has failed in public, but now there are four countries who have it. And some countries also have partial bans. France, Belgium, Austria, and Bulgaria uh, prohibit it in all public spaces. But for instance, in Holland, they have a ban that says um, when there's communication in schools, in hospitals, and in public transport, it is banned. Um, so, this is one of the pictures that appeared in one of the blogs I did for MDX Minds. Um, but of course, sometimes you're proved very wrong. I did an article in 2013 suggesting that if you were banned from wearing a religious symbol at work, you would be better off going to the Court of Justice of the European Union in Luxembourg, because in Strasbourg, the European Court of Human Rights, you did not have much chance. Um, then, the European Court of Justice came out with two cases on the wearing of headscarves and proved me wrong, because they didn't win in Luxembourg either. And one of the problems, well, one of the problems I had with that was that the judgment came out um, on the day that I was speaking on the religion and belief discrimination in at the Academy of European Law in Trier. And I was speaking at 10 o'clock, and the judgment was due to arrive at 9.30. <laughs> so, panic, 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 because if I don't get this judgment, my talk is already old hat. Um, luckily, I managed to get the um, uh, press release just before the talk, then we decided to have a very early coffee break, so I had at least 20 minutes to look at it, and I was able to enter in, incorporate it in my talk. Um, but uh, the case, of course, of course, just the European Union gave me an opportunity to do a bit more, and after that case, I wrote a report for the European Commission as well. Um, then one of our external examiners um, said to me, "Is it time for a second edition of your?" Talk on the wearing of religious symbols. And I thought, never really thought about a second edition. Should I have a second edition? Thought about it. There have been so many different developments. I wasn't even sure if the publisher did second editions. So I decided to have a very short, it was a page and a little bit, um, proposal of what I wanted to do. They sent it out for review, that little proposal, and I now have a book on fact to update it. But I think I've given myself a two tie deadline, but that's another thing that I, I think I might have to deal with at some stage. Anyway, I will expand the book to include more than just education. I want to go look at employment, I want to look at public places, and of course, I will look at the two different courts and what the Court of Justice uh, of the European Union has done in those cases as well. So, really, that's two of my the areas of my research, which are very current, which are developing all the time. Which means that all this work might be totally irrelevant in a couple of years' time, or even in a couple of months' time, because things move very quickly. Um, and sometimes it's very frustrating, because you write something, it's published, and something changes. And you sort of ah, that's my, my article, my book is, is old anyway. But at least it gives me something to keep talking and to keep looking at. Um, that's really all I wanted to say about my research and a bit about myself. Um, just, of course, at the end of these sort of talks, we have to have big thank yous. Um, thank you all for coming and sharing this occasion with me. I would like to thank especially Professor Anna Cipriano, Professor Joshua Castellino, and Professor Lauren Esch for all their support in many different ways over the years that I've been in Middlesex. Big thank you to colleagues in the law group, but also or in, the, in the department, but also in the wider school. Um, because you make it a fun place to work, and a fun place to work with other people. Big thank you to friends and colleagues. Friends includes my colleagues. Um, and of course, a big thank you to both my sons and their wives, Mark and Amy and Ben and Rosie, who are here to share it, and who represent the family. My sister, Leia, and her husband, Pete, Another representation of our family. And last but not least, my husband Chris. Um, he put down for this talk um, as his job support staff. <laughs> <laughs> and as his company, Prof Howard Research. Um, he does so much more than support me in his research.
research. But I thank him very much for all the research he's given to me. Thank you all very much.